this page was created to teach black history. Unfortunately, the American educational system was designed to exclude our real historical account, so we are here to dismantle it. It's time to enlighten those of us who have been kept in the dark. I too was a black man who didn't know enough about our own history, so I began to dig deeper and do my own research. I want people of all races and cultures to join together to learn our history as one. Here, I will share all of my findings. Please share and support Teaching Black History. The Story of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was born into slavery in Tolbert County, Maryland. Douglas was born in February 1818. Though the exact date of his birth is unknown, he later chose to celebrate the 14th of February as his birth date. Douglas was of mixed race, which likely included Native American and African on his mother's side, as well as European, and his father was almost certainly white. Douglas claimed that his mother Harriet Bailey gave him his grand name, and after escaping to the North years later, he took the short name Douglas. After separation from his mother during infancy, young Frederick lived with his maternal grandmother, Betsy Bailey, who was also a slave, and his maternal grandfather, Isaac, who was free. At the age of six, Frederick was separated from his grandparents and moved to the Y House Plantation, where Aaron Anthony worked as an overseer. After Anthony died in 1826, Douglas was given to Lucretia Auld. Lucretia was essential in creating who Douglas was as she shaped his experiences and had a special interest in Douglas from the time he was a child, wanting to give him a better life. Douglas felt that he was lucky to be in the city where he said slaves were almost freed men compared to those on plantations. When Douglas was about 12, Sophia Auld began teaching him the alphabet. Her husband, Hugh Auld, disapproved of the tutoring, feeling that the literacy would encourage slaves to desire freedom. She stopped teaching him altogether and hid all potential reading materials, including her Bible, from him. Douglas continued secretly to teach himself how to read and write. He later often said, knowledge is the pathway from slavery to freedom. When Douglas was hired out to William Freeland, he taught other slaves on the plantation to read the New Testament at a weekly Sunday school. As word spread, the interest among slaves in learning to read was so great that in any week, more than 40 slaves would attend lessons. In 1833, Douglas was sent to work for Edward Covey, a poor farmer who had a reputation as a slave breaker. He whipped Douglas so regularly that his wounds had little time to heal. Douglas later said the freaking whippings broke his body, soul, and spirit. The 16-year-old Douglas finally rebelled against the beatings, however, and fought back. After Douglas won a physical confrontation, Covey never tried to beat him again. Douglas came to see his physical fight with Covey as life transforming and introduced the story in his autobiography as such. You have seen how a man was made a slave. You shall see how a slave was made a man. Douglas tried to escape from Freeland, but was unsuccessful. In 1837, Douglas met and fell in love with Anna Murray, a free black woman. Her free status strengthened his belief in the possibility of gaining his own freedom. On September 3rd, 1838, Douglas successfully escaped by boarding a northbound train of the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. Dressed in a sailor's uniform, he carried identification papers and protection papers that he had obtained from
from a free black seaman. His entire journey to freedom took less than 24 hours. Once Douglas had arrived, he sent for Murray to follow him north to New York. She brought with her the necessary basics for them to set up a home. They were married on September 15th, 1838. The couple settled in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1841, a short time later. Douglas spoke at the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society's annual convention. Then, 23 years old, Douglas conquered his nervousness and gave an eloquent speech about his rough life as a slave. In 1843, Douglas joined other speakers in the American Anti-Slavery Society's Hundreds Conventions Project, a six-month tour at meeting halls throughout the eastern and midwestern United States. At a lecture in Pendleton, Indiana, an angry mob chased and beat Douglas before a local Quaker family, the Hardys, rescued him. His hand was broken in the attack. It healed improperly and bothered him for the rest of his life. In 1847, Frederick Douglass explained to Garrison, I have no love for America. As such, I have no patriotism. I have no country. What country have I? The institutions of this country do not know me, do not recognize me as a man. Douglass set sail on the Cambria for Liverpool, England on August 16th, 1845. The feeling of freedom from American racial discrimination amazed Douglas. Douglas spent two years in Ireland and Great Britain, where he gave many lectures in churches and chapels. His draw was such that some facilities were crowded to suffocation. In 1846, Douglas became legally free as British supporters led by Anna Richardson and her sister-in-law Ellen raised funds to buy his freedom from an American owner. Many supporters tried to encourage Douglas to remain in England, but with his wife still in Massachusetts and three million of his black brethren in bondage in the United States, he returned to America in the spring of 1847. After returning to the U.S., Douglas started publishing his first abolitionist newspaper, the North Star from the basement of the Memorial AME Zion Church in Rochester, New York. In 1848, Douglas was the only African American to attend the Seneca Falls Convention, the first woman's rights convention in upstate New York. Douglas stood and spoke eloquently in favor of women's suffrage. He said that he could not accept the right to vote as a black man if women could not also claim that right. He suggested that the world would be a better place if women were involved in the political sphere. After Douglas's powerful words, the attendees passed the resolution. On July 5th, 1852, Douglas delivered an address to the ladies of Rochester Anti-Slavery Sewing Society. This speech eventually became known as what to the slave is the 4th of July. One biographer called it perhaps the greatest anti-slavery oration ever given. Like many abolitionists, Douglas believed that education would be crucial for African Americans to improve their lives. This led Douglas to become an early advocate for school desegregation. Douglas observed that New York's facilities and instruction for African American children were vastly inferior to those for whites. Douglas called for court action to open all schools to all children. He said that full inclusion within the educational system was a more pressing need for African Americans than political issues such as suffrage. Douglas also considered photography very important to ending slavery and racism and believed that the camera would not lie even in the hands of a racist white, as photographs were an excellent counter to the many racist caricatures, particularly in blackface. He was the most photographed American of the 19th century. 
using photography to advance his political views, he never smiled, specifically so as not to play into the racist caricature of a happy slave. He tended to look directly into the camera to confront the viewer with a stern look. As a child, he began reading and copying Bible verses, and he eventually converted to Christianity. Although a believer, he strongly criticized religious hypocrisy and accused slaveholders of wickedness, lack of morality, and failure to follow the golden rule. He sharply criticized the attitudes of religious people who kept silent about slavery and held that religious ministries committed a blasphemy when they taught it as sanctioned by religion. During his visits to the United Kingdom between 1846 and 1848, Douglas asked British Christians never to support American churches that permitted slavery. By the time of the Civil War, Douglas was one of the most famous black men in the country, known for his orations on the condition of the black race and on other issues such as women's rights. On April 14, 1876, Douglas delivered the keynote speech at the unveiling of the Emancipation Memorial in Washington, Lincoln's Park. In that speech, Douglas spoke frankly about Lincoln, calling him the white man's president. Douglas criticized Lincoln's tardiness in joining the cause of emancipation. Douglas and Anna Murray had five children together. After Anna died in 1882, in 1884, Douglas married again to Helen Pitts, a white abolitionist from New York. Their marriage provoked a storm of controversy since Pitts was both white and nearly 20 years younger than Douglas. Her family stopped speaking to her. Douglas responded to the criticisms by saying that his first marriage had been to someone the color of his mother and his second to someone the color of his father. At the 1888 Republican National Convention, Douglas became the first African American to receive a vote for president of the United States in a major party's roll call vote. In 1892, Douglas constructed rental housing for blacks, now known as Douglas Place, in the Fells Point area of Baltimore. The complex still exists and in 2003 was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. On February 20th, 1895, Douglas attended a meeting of the National Council of Women in Washington, D.C. During that meeting, he was brought to the platform and received a standing ovation. Shortly after he returned home, Douglas died of a massive heart attack. He was 77 years old.